in the blue corner, uh, we have a great guest, someone who's uh, very outspoken, always entertaining. Uh, I heard he can fight a little bit, too. Just a little, just a little, Doug. Uh, Doug Fisher, Jaime Mota here with you guys. And like I said, uh, our guest is someone who, uh, man, he could dance circles around fighters when he wanted to. He could uh, sit there and mix it up. Yeah. Um, he's always got a hot take, always has an opinion. Uh, he fought guys, you know, a two-division world champion. Yeah. Uh, a guy that fought the likes of Love Amor and Do. He fought guys like Adrian Broner, Zab Judah, Miguel Cotto, Sean Porter, Danny Gar I mean, this guy never said no to a tough fight. That's true. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. From Brooklyn, New York, with a record of 37 and 8 with seven knockouts. 36 and 7. 36 and 7. Uh, well, I'm, you know... Uh, one, I got I got to talk to Box Rec about that. But anyways, here with you is Pauly, the Magic Man, Malinaji. What's up? Yeah, oh, I haven't heard it announced like that in a while. Magic yeah, Man, that's Made right. me feel like I was fighting again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to try to get to, you know, to fight here now. You know what's uh, funny, though? It's like um, you're almost, I mean, boxing fans around the world know you. Um, they knew you were a fighter, obviously. Um, but I, I think what you achieved in the ring actually gets underrated because of your out of the ring persona, your yeah. personality, Sometimes. and your, 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 your commentating career. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. I, a lot of people do tell me that. Like, you're probably a better commentator than you are a fighter. And I said, oh, may, that's... Maybe, oh, oh, maybe. Be honest. But that that kind of gets it, on your nerves. Man. It's <laughs> possible, you know. But you know what? It's funny. I, I, I didn't finish school. I don't have a formal education. So I wouldn't have been able to do any commentating if I hadn't had a successful boxing career. So maybe that was the, the path that I, I had to go in order to reach this path now. You, you know? did, you got the Boxing Writers Association of America, their mm -hmm. award mm -hmm. for commentating, yeah. broadcasting. Yeah. I think that was, it's called, it's like a- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sam, it's the Sam Taub Sa Award. Yeah, yeah. Sam mm -hmm. Taub uh, mm -hmm. Broadcasting mm -hmm. Award. I think just like maybe one year mm -hmm. after you started with Showtime. Yeah, it was after my first full year. Yeah. 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 Well, I, Paulie, you, you're I'm someone sure. who's seen things from both sides. You know, you've seen, things inside the ring, uh, outside the ring, you know, where we're at. Um, what do you think the state of boxing is like right now? Um, I think there's always action fights that can be made. There's good, you know, everybody always talks about the good old days, but I think the good old days are just really your prime age of when you saw great fighters, you know, your original, you know, the originals of, of, of when your person saw great fighters, you know, because, I'm biased, definitely. Because, yeah. because, you know, there's people that the older people tell me the eighties and seventies, right. And then there's people that, that now, now I'm getting to the point where I'm an old timer You are. and, 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 and I got younger guys coming up to me and telling me, man, the guys today aren't like your generation. And I'm like, you know, so, and, <laughs> yeah, thousands? Yeah. so first of all, Damn. it makes me feel older, but second of all, you know, I, I think it, it, it makes me realize with human nature, we have a, a certain nostalgic feeling towards our prime years and the people who got us into the sport or so, some, or so on and so forth, you know? So, so, um, I think just by having said that, I, what I'm saying is, uh, there's always good fights that can be made. There's always talented fighters in every generation. Um, and so for boxing fans, I think, you know, there's always possibilities to get excited. Uh, the state of boxing to cross over, though, I think it's more difficult because of the confusion with belts, the confusion with uh, inconsistency in the rulemaking and inconsistency in a lot of other things. So it's hard for people to realize, you know, like I, I see casuals when we're talking about championship boxes and they say, yeah, but in boxing, everybody gets a belt. Not necessarily because not every belt is worth the same thing. You know what I'm saying? But a casual. But there are a lot a, of well, no, a lot There's of a ton of belts, way too many belts. But. Uh, a casual, there's some amazing uh, but, fighters but, but, who never won a belt. Yeah, and a real never won a real belt. You know, yeah. you can win any belt. You can right. win a state belt. It's that's not a belt. But what I'm saying is right. But I'm saying casual, tell tell Oba Carr you yeah, never won a belt. Of course, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. okay. Even uh, a guy like a Jerry Quarry in the 70s, you right? Know, or or, or, or Ernie, Sh Ernie Shavers, yeah. yeah. Or Ivan Shavers, Robinson yeah. in the 90s, yeah. You know, so you 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 you've got that, but then um, the and what I'm saying is the casual gets confused. And then just mixes them all in together. Anybody, anybody in boxing win a belt, so it makes it harder for casuals to understand the sport. So it makes, and therefore, it makes it harder for casuals to join us and becoming more hardcore fans because the sport gets more and more confusing to understand. Well, like like I mentioned in your intro, uh, 
you fought just about anybody that they put in front of you. Uh, you know, you never said no to a big fight. Mm -hmm. Now, nowadays, that's one of the biggest problems in boxing. We can't get the fights that the people want to see. Why are we getting them? You know, if you look at every generation, there's probably fights that weren't made that should have been made. It's just we complain about the present. But, I mean, I look at, you know, for example, I used to train with Buddy McGirt. You know, you know we were in his gym uh, earlier, right? So with Buddy McGirt, I asked him, you know, why didn't the Chavez fight ever get made? You know, Pernell got to fight Chavez. So I was like, well, you know, why didn't you ever get to fight Chavez? It just didn't happen. You know, I would have loved to fight Chavez. It just didn't happen, you know? So, so you know, we, there's situations where fights don't happen a lot of times. I think that's why Ali gets so much credit. He was able to, he was the guy in command. And usually the guy in command, the, the star of the generation, can pick and choose. And he always typically does. Ali is probably, and this is why he's the greatest, is probably the only guy who was in the command center. He was at the, in the command position of being the star of the generation. And he still chose to fight everybody. Right. Everybody. And gave them rematches too a lot of times. A lot you know? of so, rematches. So, 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 so what I'm saying is, if you look at any top fighter of any generation, they're a top fighter for a reason. They're excellent. But there's always fights that don't get made for some reason or another. You know what I'm saying? It's like, uh, it, it, it can be frustrating. A lot of people tell me about the 80s. Uh, Leonard and Aaron Pryor never happened. You know, and Aaron Pryor wanted that fight. I saw, I saw a clip, video clip of Aaron Pryor trying to interrupt Howard Cosell uh, at, on a, at, when Howard Cosell was speaking on a podium. And Cosell kind of just bursts them off like he's an amateur, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I might have spit on Cosell there, you know, but, <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is, you know, he, that fight didn't happen, you know, um, so there, what I'm, and, and it doesn't diminish the greatness of the fighters of, those, of each generation, but what I'm saying is we can complain about fights that don't happen now, but it happens in every generation. That's true, <laughs> but at, at, in previous decades, and I'm going to say up until the 90s, I think the, the, the business structure of the sport in terms of um, the networks, um, and, and just the infrastructure allowing fighters to fight more than a few times a year, yeah. I think that increased the likelihood of yeah. enough yeah. of the big fights because to happen. You, you, if you're fighting more, you're for knocking off right. enough contenders and then be like, oh, this is the man for the, could, only these two guys right. to be left, You could you have know? a guy who is like the gold. I'm looking at a picture across the room. It says the golden boy, Oscar mm -hmm. De La Hoya. And I'm remembering Oscar as a lightweight. And in 1995, it's the year he was Ring Magazine's Fighter of the Year, he fought four times, mm -hmm. and all four guys were badasses. That's why he was fighter of the year. I don't. Mm -hmm. I, I, mean, I think it was John John Molina, yeah. Rafael Reyes, Gennaro Hernandez, and Jesse James Leha. Right? You can check box. That, that's, 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 that's pretty good. Right? Right? I, I, I thought, fought them all this, the same year. This is right? a, all the same year. That's off the top of my head. But yeah, if not in that order, he fought them all in in, in the same calendar year. Right? So then '96, he goes up to uh, junior welterweight, and he beats just some guy. Um, which is to set up a showdown with Julio Cesar Chavez, you know, who's, you know, past his prime, long in the tooth, but his record is like 96, one and one, and he's a Mexican legend and mm -hmm. everyone knows who he is. So of course, duh, mm -hmm. that's the fight that's going to happen. When I open up the, the, the ring magazine rankings from early 1996, Oscars, you know, he's like maybe like number eight in at junior welterweight. And uh, Chavez is like number two or three. It's behind. You're giving me nostalgia because I can remember right. opening yeah. those magazines. You can remember opening it. I remember reading. Did them Did you in those used times. to like underline yeah. them and circle them I, and like I'd match them up? Them, and, like, but I'd this read is them and reread them and reread them. You know? So what I remember <laughs> is looking at welterweight and thinking that that's the damn division. Number one was Pernell Whitaker. Okay. Number two was Felix Trinidad. Number three was Ike Corte, and number four was Oba Carr. See, but but the the thing with those guys was that they were willing to fight other guys and they didn't mind taking the loss and then going for a rematch. Well, well, now, now you, there's guys that the right. record is the most important. So how, I mean, how to important a degree, is, to a degree, they made, a, they made us, to be they made undefeated. Us, they made us wait for Oscar and Trinidad. I mean, that, sure. I mean, they, we got it. But it didn't they, happen they, right away. But right. We, no, we were but, made to wait But in for your it. day and before. But, but what I'm, but you're right in that it's happening later and later. Like, look at this, but, for example. Look at um, Hearns and Leonard. It happened both in their early 20s. Yeah. That, so my preference, and this is why it's my preference, and I'm sure most fans would agree with this. When there's excellent fighters, you want them to fight in their prime or as close to their prime as possible because besides the skill set, there's also your mindset is different. When you're in your prime or even close to your prime, you're still more ferocious in a right. mindset. 
when you're past your prime and you've made a lot of money, you may still have the skill set, but you're going to wind up fighting a Mayweather Pacquiao fight where it's like, mm -hmm. oh, let's just both not get hurt. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, I, neither guy wants to take a big chance because because both guys have a set bank account. Yeah, but some of these guys, you know, they well, just want to stay undefeated. That, Oscar and Trinidad still fall close to their prime. Right. Um, well, here's the thing. They were in their 20s, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and my original point of pointing out those rankings and looking at where Oscar was mm -hmm. and then looking at the division ahead of him and thinking, hey, wouldn't it be great if he fought those guys? The fact of the matter is, by the end of the 90s, by the time he faced Felix Trinidad in what they were calling the fight of the millennium, he had fought Pernell Whitaker, Obakar, Ike Corte, leading into the big showdown with Felix Trinidad. Now, let me ask okay. you something. And, and, and this, all these fights happened when these guys were like the, the, the top welterweights, with the exception of Whitaker, they were in the 20s. Well, Whitaker was the world champion. He, he, he was the fight, world he champion. Had to fight and, he, to take and, the belt. and he was number one pound for pound. Well, yeah. let me ask you something. Also, most of these guys that everybody considered the, considers them to, to be, you know, the big guys in different eras, they are all defined at least by one rival who they faced three times let's say you know mm -hmm. the big trilogies we we don't get to see that anymore yeah uh, but that, why it's, it's why also, don't all... guys want to face like let's say a manny pacquiao marquez for example mm -hmm. and you know we we mentioned leonard Hagler, hurts they but all you gotta each beat other. each other in order for that to happen exactly well. you know you got and 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 in, in for example floyd's situation you know he he hasn't really had to do that. When he had the controversial decision with Castillo, he he did fight him again. You know, uh, other than that, I mean, who's been competitive enough? Kind of competitive and competitive enough with Floyd? Maidana, he gave him Maidana, a rematch, right? And they had a rematch. So, so right. you know, Floyd has done what you asked of him as far as that's concerned. Um, but he we we don't even can't even talk about Floyd anymore because Floyd's retired, right? Yeah. So we have a current generation, and Spence and Crawford are letting their primes go by and. Not well, even close. Right. Not both even, guys, not both even, guys are in their not 30s. They're not, in the even, 30s, not right? even close to having come to a, not even having come close to fighting. I, I want to tell you what the difference is and, and why we got return bouts um, on a number of levels um, and why we got, you know, like Paulie said, we didn't get all the fights we wanted to see, but enough to where there's, there's some fan service, there's fan satisfaction, right? Um, you had a, a, a powerhouse network player in HBO that cut the biggest check and they weren't exclusive to one or two promoters. So you had yeah. the, the yeah. 800 pound now gorilla in yeah. the sport, now. which is, which is yeah. HBO, which that's can say, this is what's going to yeah. happen and guys, that, that's because you're not going to yeah. make as much money taking this then, fight to Showtime yeah. or in network televisions done with you. So if we want this fight, you guys are going to do it. And guess what? We'll welcome main events, Don King, Bob Arum's top rank. Oh, and new kids in the block, Golden Boy, come on. Yeah, that's right. fine, and whatever. Yeah. And, and it was that, basically, the promoters had to put together a big enough fight to mm -hmm. where HBO is going to open up that checkbook and say, yeah, you know what? It's this fight's problem. worth $10 it's a million. Point, though. You know? Yeah, and now, here's now they what, make exclusive deals. They, right. they handcuff themselves. The, yeah. net, the promoter is in a, an alliance with one platform. And thereby, the promote the network is also in alliance with the promoter and can't do right. other under shows. I remember when I was working at Showtime. Now I can just spill the beans. Now here, you right? can talk. Uh, talk so, about it. Let's I remember working on. at Showtime. We had a great year in 2013. I remember yeah. we had a lot of great fights in 2013. We had picked up some nice fights, and then Al Heyman started to. Well, I think it was 2014. Was that when he started to get the other contracts with the other networks when he had the time buys? Yeah. Yes. And that was the first time around because then when they went through it again with Fox. But this is before Fox is when he first got NBC, CBS, when he went the first full, 2015. Full go round. Yeah. We had a very poor year. Very, very poor year. You know? And I remember asking my boss, like, why don't we just do all the fights? I, I didn't know, understand it. I could imagine. I'm already 33, 34. I didn't understand <laughs> because of that. that the, sport, the business had model had changed. Like this business model where you become exclusive with one promoter, one network, happened during the course of my career. At right. the beginning of my career, it was not like this. Right. You know, so so I still wasn't understanding that the sh the, the the business had shifted. So I remember telling my boss like, why don't we just get all the fights? These fights suck, bro. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, and and he and he wasn't telling me that he's exclusive to Heyman. He wasn't telling me. He was just like making other reasoning. And I'm like, bro, there's like there's other fights that can be made that you know we can get them instead of the other networks getting them or something. I mean, now, you know, I wasn't that long after that I understood why, but at the moment I didn't get it, but 
it was costing us. You know, obviously then it came back around to us, you know, and then and then when Fox came, we lost it again. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, you know, I think they're gonna lose the Fox deal, so they'll probably get a lot of dates next year again. Yeah. But it, you, you're you're handcuffed to this business model now. It's it's changed, and that same business model also hurts the ability to make some big fights. Don't get me, you still had this kind of problem a little bit when it was HBO and Showtime, just HBO and Showtime, but not as bad as you have it now, because now there's so many alliances. Well, You've basically created the MMA model without having the MMA model. The MMA model is basically, everybody talks about MMA, everybody fights each other, wrong. In MMA, <laughs> you have to fight a, you have to sign an exclusive contract with one promoter. They call right. it a league. It's, a, it's, a, it's, the, it's the equivalent of a promoter, and you cannot fight anybody from any other promoter. Well, and no, so you are handcuffed to fighting only the fighters from that promotion. We're here with uh, Pauli Malinaji, who uh, was getting a little bit riled up talking about the uh, UFC model versus the boxing no, business see, model. Even, even you get caught up into it. It's called MMA. It's not called UFC. UFC, uh, the MMA model is the same for every promotion. The UFC a, started it. That's a strong that's, brand right see? there. See? That's exactly. That's how strong the brand <laughs> okay. is. That people, like a lot of people ask me like, would you ever do UFC? Bro, it's MMA. Don't stop calling it by the name of the promotion. The sport is called MMA. But it's ex there's exclusive deals there, you know? And go ahead. But, and, and, but, that's, but that's the one thing you, you were talking about, how everybody says, well, you know, in MMA, everybody fights everybody. No, they don't. Exactly. They just fight within their own promotion. You know, so it's not everybody fights everybody. And just because one promotion is better sold to you than another promotion doesn't necessarily make it better. I mean, I, there's fighters that were top fighters in the UFC. They went over to one and got their ass beat. You know what I mean? So, so it's, you don't know. You may find top fighters maybe in the UFC. Then some, in some weight classes, maybe the better fighters are here. And the, or you can just mix and match them. You'll never be able to do that. And the fact that it's not even talked about shows you how dumb that fan base even is. Because you should actually be talking about why can't these guys fight one another? You know what I'm saying? It's because they know it's impossible, they don't even discuss it. And because they don't even discuss it, nobody ever realizes that certain fights don't get made in that sport. And then they blame us because we're with the old business model where cross-promotional fights can happen because we're an older sport. So they talk about, oh, guys don't fight each other. Bro, you guys are the worst for not fighting each other. Are but, you kidding but me? Paulie, and, and I don't, I don't follow... Because top rank could easily just make all top rank fights. You know, most of the promoters are starting well, to they, do that. They do you a know? lot of that. And then PBC does the same thing. So you, if, if you want more of that, you're going to become... Like the MMA brand a model. But, but Paulie, and, and I don't follow... And Vince McMahon started follow. this, by the way, in wrestling. He started first right. in wrestling. Dana White copied him. Yeah. He, well, I think Dana White took good elements from, from pro wrestling and from boxing. Um, and the stuff that didn't work in boxing, he wanted to ace that out. Mm -hmm. You know, he definitely... That's one of the re reasons he keeps the, the, the purses so low. That, that's want, where I was going to go. He doesn't want right, boxers to have right too now, much agency because yeah, well, he wants well, to be the boss. But let me just say well, this. He also likes to have more money in his pocket. Right, too, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but the UFC has, has most of the top talent, MMA talent, so they can make enough of the big fights to have that fan satisfaction to where if you're a UFC fan, you're satisfied. You're, at the end of the year, you're like, the fights that I wanted to see, most of them happened. In the Am UFC. I wrong? In within, the UFC. within the UFC, yeah, right. of course. But I don't follow MMA enough yeah. to to be able to give you different things. But I, I got a lot of people, you know, the thing is one is only in Asia, bro. You know what I mean? But a lot of fighters right. that sign there, they're paying big money. You they know do. what I mean? So they're paying more money. So there's no way you're telling me the promotion that pays more money has got lesser fighters than the UFC. It's just you don't see them. You don't know them because they're right. in Asia. Okay, There's no way you're telling me that they pay more money and they got lesser fighters than, than the UFC. Maybe they're this one's better promoted, especially here in the States. Yeah. You can't convince me of that. Well, uh, you know, there's uh, always something that gets Polly riled up, you know, talking about this, talking about everything else. But we got a clip uh, where I believe you're a little bit riled up. Let's, let's take a listen. Hold on, wait, wait. Don't brag about taking my side piece. Don't brag about taking my side piece, though. That's my side piece. I'll tell you. I'll tell, I can explain this, but now I can explain it years later. Okay. First of all, it was not my girlfriend. I mean, I think that, that goes without saying. Uh, but the issue was the fight's over. I had been dealing with this media ridiculousness, and this girl had been a stalker, man. Like, I, this is the biggest stalker <laughs> I ever had in my life, honestly. Uh, she made she made up a pregnancy. It was it was rough. I wasn't even living in New York. I was living in L.A. First of all, so the, the chick wasn't my girl. It was she was just a chick I would mess with when I was in New York for a few months, um, for a few months span that it happened when I was back and forth. But nonetheless, the fight ends, and me and Broner. You know, kind of bury it, like a speak for like 30 seconds, kind of bury it, whatever. Um, I get robbed in the decision. And um, I'm going to be 
complimentative I planned on being, but I've planned on saying I thought I won the fight, you know? But he, he gets to go first because he won the fight. And he starts going on that, on that, on the tangent that he went on. I'm not going to lie, bro. I took off with the intention to sucker punch him. I took off. Like, from the moment I left my corner to run towards him, I was going to rock him. But in the, in the second that it took me to get there, I because I had been thinking about this the whole promotion, because the promotion was getting very X-rated. Mm -hmm. I might lose this job I just got. I just got the Showtime job, like That's less right. than a year. So the promotion is getting kind of heated, and I'm kind of worrying. I'm getting some hints from them, like, yo, you got to tone it down. Like, can't say some certain things. And I'm like, and I've never dealt with this before. You know, I've just always been a fighter and just said what I wanted. Yeah. And this oh, was that, a, that's for sure. You yeah, always and, did. And, and this was a, a very good job that I thought, you know, would kind of tr carry me over after I retired. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of worried throughout the promotion, but I want to match the trash talk that Broner's doing because I feel like I could and I, and I felt like I did anyway. But I felt like, you know, he was a good trash talker. So I, it, I, I'd it was, say you were pound for pound one of the yeah, best in that. Yeah, but, you know, it was a good trash talker. So I, want, I didn't want to be limited, you know, but the fact that I was limited always had me a little ap bit apprehensive. So I, this was on my mind, the whole promotion, like, don't lose his job over this fight. Don't lose his job over this fight. And so when that happened, I take off to crack him. I mean, I take, and I'm gonna get him with a good shot, bro. I would have, I would have spun his head around, bro. But by the time I get, I get there and I freeze myself. Like it hits my head. I, I get there and now I got this mic in my face and I, I'm like, ah, what do I do? What do I say? You know? And so you gotta I refocus was, that energy. I was like, you know, and whatever came out came out. You know. So, so, Hold on, wait, wait. Don't brag yeah. about it. Don't brag about it. Whatever I'm came sorry, out came out. Yeah. And I'm sorry, you know, I, I'm still glad I didn't hit him because I, I, I made a lot of good money in Showtime <laughs> for those years. If I would have hit him, there was no way they would keep that, him. You know? That sound bite, it made the rounds, though. Did, it, did that ever surprise you? No, like, it didn't like, surprise me. Like, because it was, getting like, a lot of, it was getting a lot of attention. Right. Like, I, I remember when it first got attention, my lawyer was like, just say it's not your girl. Okay? I'm like, yeah, I understand. It's not, but... These, these freaking media people are all writing like this is a, a real relationship. And it was giving her like this more ammo. This, this ammo you know what I'm saying? Sure. She was a groupie, so she was getting more ammo. She's taking interviews. She's liking so, the so attention. I'm like, yeah. So I'm like, oh man, this is annoying, man. You know, this is, you know, like I can't. And I'm like, I'm kind of trapped. I'm kind of handcuffed. You know, I'm training for a fight. Anything I, I do to address it only buries me more. But if I don't address it, the media is going to have a field day with it, you know? So it was, I was, I probably let it bother me more than I should have. Um, but I come from a culture, I mean, any, not necessarily my culture, I mean, any culture in general, right? I mean, it's like, you know, you only bring certain kind of girls home, bro. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like, I've been with a lot of girls, but you only bring certain kind of girls home, you know? So like the fact that this kind of girl was somebody, somebody people thought like I was bringing home, like, I'm like... I'm like, yo, it was bothering me. You know what I'm saying? Because I, yeah. you know, I was like, it wasn't the kind of chick you bring home did, anyway. Did you know? it bother you as much as to play a role in the way you perform in the fight? No, I, I, I don't. No, I, I think, I think I fought. I think I fought a good fight. You know, I, I think me and you Broner. Did. I think me and Broner were were well matched. I think we we speak about fights made and fights not made, and maybe it's not on the level of a pound for pound fight, even though Broner somehow was on the pound for pound list when we fought. Shouldn't have been. But but nonetheless. I do feel that, I do feel that boxing dropped the ball big time. That was a trilogy that would have been massive. That was a trilogy that people would talk about forever. That would be like uh, Graziano Zale. I don't care. Bo Holyfield. That would have been a major trilogy, and it was there to be made. Mega promotion. The best trash talkers in the I'm sport. I'm going to tell you and, what that trilogy would have been like. And, and, and close fights every time. Yep. We're very matched up. And a world championship changing hands. Because they, keep in I'm mind, tell you. Keep in what, mind the, which one? the major world title was it in. Been, it would have been Vinny Pazienza versus Greg, Greg Haugen. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Because no, one of those. Yeah. All, all three fights, hotly contested, very close, different styles. You know, one guy was more of a boxer. The other guy was more athletic. But... Between to this the day, fights, they hate each other. Yeah, yeah. Between, between the, the fights, fights it, cool. it was all but, about it was about the press conferences and the yeah. shit talk. Was they still hate each other today? Do, do they? They, they argue on I Facebook. So. They argue on Facebook. Oh, do they really? No, you gotta. You, my, my friend sends me screenshots because he follows them. I don't. I don't mess do, with. Do Facebook you argue with with Adrian? No, Brown? I know. I know. Okay. Me and Adrian actually get along now. Anybody but, else who <laughs> you you think you would have had uh, the chance of having a great trilogy? Um, 
maybe me and Juan could have probably fought a third fight, I guess. Sure. You know, that never happened. Um, Juan Diaz. Yeah, yeah. maybe Juan Baby Diaz. But, but, but I don't think Juan was a real super lightweight. You know, I think he tested it out with mm -hmm. me. And I, I, I think he realized like it wasn't, uh, it wasn't for him, you know. Um, but Juan was a very good fighter. Juan had some excellent wins. That's actually, that's actually a, a rivalry I had in my career that you know people kind of forget about, you know. Because now it's been 12 years. I think people forget about Juan really because he he retired so young and he went he away did. so young. But he that guy accomplished a lot. I mean that guy unified, unified titles. Yep, unified beat a lot champ. of other guys that were champions as well. You know. Well, you uh, know what you were talking about how young Sugar Ray and Tommy Hearns were when they fought. When Juan won his first world title, he was 20. Yeah. Two yeah. zero. Yeah. He was 20 years mm -hmm. old. Oh, he, uh, was a, so he, he was a he was a phenom. Yeah, he took he took I think advantage he qualified, of his of his. Youth. I think he qualified for the Olympics, and then the the U.S. protested or something that he was too, he was young, too young, and they threw him off. You know, so yeah. for you, he, pro, he qualified for Mexico. So, so you know, I think me and Juan had an opportunity to to have a, a trilogy, even though I felt I won the first fight, but he got it. But the same would have been the same thing with Broner. I mean, I felt like I got the first fight. You weren't gonna rob me twice. Listen, you if you make the rematch, if it's close again, you're gonna give me the decision this time. You know, because if you rob me twice, I'm probably gonna kick somebody, come one of the judges' heads off their bodies right from the <laughs> ring. You know, so. So yeah, it's not gonna happen. Yeah. But no, see, that's what everybody remembers from the first fight against the baby bull. That was in Texas, right? Yeah. Was yeah. the post fight yeah. interview? Yeah, tirade. because I was angry. But it comes a point in your life where you're probably sick of dealing with that. Like, so I kind of retired at the right time and all that stuff. And you lose your prime at the right time, I think. Because say I stay in my prime. If I go through enough of those rivalries, I'm gonna uh, enough of enough of those robberies. Because I got robbed, then I go get robbed in the Ben Uncle fight too, bro. Like I gotta, I'm gonna kick somebody because I, I imagine it. Because I'm you're above the judges. You can and the judges sit right here. You, they're there to be field goal kicked, bro. I would I don't care if it's guy, girl, old, young. Yeah. Take it how you want it. But you're taking money out of my pocket when you do that. A lot of money. And the Broner fight cost me millions. That's, that's, a, true. that's, that's a difference of millions of dollars. If somebody comes in your, in your pocket and takes your money out of your pocket, what are you going to do? You're going to hit them, right? So right. it's the same thing. You took, they took millions of dollars out of my pocket when, when, when they took that fight from me. Because I, I lost my world championship. And also, I would have gave them. You could have made the fight a draw, which right. probably would have been the best result. Make, make, but you know why? A draw doesn't give him the belt. And like I said in the show, they already mailed the WBA title that night. They wanted him to leave the building. Right, so, so explain, that explain Actually, to I us exactly. I should believe that it was the WBA. Explain still, to us exactly yeah. what happened with that belt. Um, and I don't know if it's the BA themselves. It could have been the promotion themselves. I don't know. I don't. I mean, everybody was talking about Golden Boy Heyman. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, bro. I do know I'm the older fighter. I'm 32. Um, I do know that um, you know. Broner's the next phenom who's being written about at that time. Like I said, Ring Magazine had him on the pound for pound list, even we though I didn't agree have. at that time. I didn't but either. What I, but just based on potential, you know? Yeah. But I don't know who to blame for having a copy of the BA title there. I mean, it's not necessarily that it's the BA's fault. It can also be, you know, the people that are running the show themselves. Right. For know? the so, people that don't know, what happens to the belt, you know, when a champion... When you beat a champion, you take the belt inside the ring and you take pictures with it and you know you're the crown the new world champion they announce you you get picked up whatever it is you do yeah. that belt physical copy of the belt is not yours it belongs you to give your it rival back. Yeah. when you go back to the dressing room you give it back to the to your opponent and they keep that belt like a trophy you know mm -hmm. i still have the copies of my world championships and then the organization the sanctioning body mails you a copy of the world title you know the next week or whatever and then you have your copy and when you lose it you'll do the same thing um so I remember, I didn't even realize it. You know how I realized it? I'll tell you the story now, because I didn't get into it before. The fight ends, the fiasco happens as we just uh, played the tape. And uh, I leave the ring, you know, we gotta make that walk back to the dressing room. I'm aggravated, I'm talking to my team, I'm pissed. And I get to the dressing room and I tell my best friend, Peter, I'm like, yo, Pete, go get my belt, do me a favor. And he goes, no, we got it. And I'm like, I mean, we got it. I saw, I, I saw Brona holding it. He's like, nah, they, that was, they already have Brona's copy. This is your copy. I was like, what? Oh. Man, how did I? Why don't you guys tell me when I was in the ring? I would have created a rocket, <laughs> man. I would have, I would have made a mess. Are you kidding me? Like now, you're telling me? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, that my team too. Like, why don't you tell me that in the ring, bro? You know what I mean? Because they're not expecting it. They're just like, huh? Yeah, of course, oh, okay. but still, right, you yeah. gotta tell me. I'll, I'll handle the mess. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll make the mess. You don't even have to make the mess. Just so they had know. already shipped the replica yeah. to Broner before the fight. Yeah, they I had mean, a belt ready with his name on it. I, I mean, I Basically. don't know if his name is on or it, but it was you, know, you have to get it engraved with your name. Right, you, right. But, but your copy of the belt is your copy, okay. you know? And that was, that was how it happened. Again, I don't know. I mean, somebody's to blame. 
I don't necessarily think it's the BA. I don't. Okay. They, I don't necessarily think the BA. Well, they got cares enough problems. Yeah, I don't care necessarily don't think to. the BA. So somebody cares. else had I don't think need necessarily, to be I don't, think, I, yeah, I don't necessarily think the BA cared who won the fight, but I yeah. think the in the promotion and there's multiple people in that promotion, yeah. they cared who won the fight. You know, and yes. and you know. I get it. And that was, I'm older. But, I'm but 32. That was evident. I'm 32. Yeah. He's 23. Yeah. There's an upside. Ring Magazine's got him on the pound for pound list. So there's an upside that you're, you know, potentially looking at so much money. They call him the next mm -hmm. Mayweather. This guy's 32. How long is he going to be around? You know, we'll go. You know. Yeah. So I get it. But when I, I get why it happened, but it doesn't mean it's right. You know? Right. So, and then on top of it, give me the rematch, right? Give me the rematch. That's why I originally wasn't taking the Judah fight. I wanted Broner. I, I, didn't, I didn't take the Judah fight when they first offered it to me because I wanted Broner. But then it's I, crazy then, that they did Then they, then they yeah. made Broner my Donna. Right. And I realized I wasn't going to get Broner. So now I'm like, what am I not going to fight? Yeah. So I'm like, all right, we'll do, we'll, we'll do, we'll do Judah. And, and that was another great fight. Yeah. You won. Yeah. 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 yeah well, a little and bit Broner of an got beat, that though. <laughs> and that eliminated all the chance of the rematch because you can still do the rematch, but you know when you're with a, when you're when there's a world championship trip switching hands in in, the, in these big rivalries, it makes it that much more because it was a major world title, you know. So it makes it that much more mouth watering. You know, you've got this great promotion, you've got this great matchup, a lot of trash talking, everybody's into it. But the winner is also the world champion, you know. So once you that once that that little tidbit gets eliminated, even if you make the rematch, it's not. Why does nobody talk about? Yeah. Uh, Ali Frazier too. There's no belt on the line. Nobody right. ever talks about Ali Frazier. And it wasn't immediate. I don't, even see, I don't, even, see, I don't yeah. even see footage. I don't, right. I don't, nobody even talks about the fight. So once on he lost to no Madonna, I, I knew I wasn't going to. Don't brag about so, so taking my side piece. piece. Don't brag about taking my side piece. No, that's my side piece. Paul, you were saying uh, during the break that that fight with Broner was the highest rated uh, fight on Showtime that year. Yeah. Um, so uh, add more to the pot for another reason for a rematch, right? I mean, I, I don't know what reasons you had to not make the rematch. Everything, Wor everything, worrying, all worrying about Broner not winning it, which he didn't anyway. In the next oh, fight, he yeah. lost to Maidana, so you ruined that anyway. Now, who else would you have liked to fight, uh, or anybody else that maybe riled you up as much during a promotion or um, going into a fight? I'll tell you the probably the other guy that was annoying that probably, you know. I wouldn't say we left off on bad terms, or we wouldn't leave off on such good terms. Usually, most of my opponents leave off on good terms, right? A lot of respect if you see with me and Miguel and, and Zab, you know, but but another guy that was kind of annoying, but it was in a different way. Like like Broner kind of made it street. Love Morendo, like he you know, he was a lawyer. He was like he had this arrogance like about him, bro. You know, it makes you want to like like mush him in his face. You know what I'm saying? Like just like he had this like this snotness, snottiness about him, you know, like nose in the air type of thing about him, you know? And he was always like, you know, he was always making comments. Even after the rematch I had with him, he was making comments. The only reason he even got the rematch was because Heyman had him and, you know, he had a rematch close even though he lost every second of every round of the first fight, you know? It was sort of like Barrera Morales, Barrera talking down on Morales and telling him, you know, he, yeah. he was this, you know, uh, low life and whatnot, and that got the you yeah. know, the rivalry, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. The, all yeah. fired up as well. I because you know, men have egos, right? So, and different things can like poke at the ego, you know. Like I don't know, for me, the whole elitism thing, I can't stand it, bro. I can't stand it. I can't stand it in society. I can't stand. It. And don't bring it to boxing, man. You know, we're all like the same. When we step in the ring, we're all the same, man. You know, I don't care where you come from. Doesn't matter where I come from. That thing evens everything out right there. That square circle evens everything out, you know? So I can't stand the elitism and whatnot. And, and Endo had, like, uh, a bit of that, you know? Like, even now, he's a lawyer. And he's still, to this day, when he talks about me, I still see the comments that sometimes come, come my way. People send them to me. He still has that about him, you know? It's, I don't know. Whatever. But, but also, going into that fight, you were telling us that you trained even harder because you had just come off the fight with Koto. Yeah. And, and, and so that made you, you know, train even harder, even though you probably would have done the same thing without him being, you know, such yeah. an elitist. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't say I trained harder because I've trained very hard at that time for every fight. Um, and I was young enough to where I was able to and not get hurt. Right. Uh, but I trained within a focus and even a feeder because I knew I wasn't with a major promoter. When I, um, let's get this straight. We could, we talked about this too um, earlier that you know Zab and 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 Kodos turned pro with a major promoter. 
I thought I was turning pro with a major promoter. You have to put, be in my shoes in 2001 when I turned pro, and Lou DiBella has just left HBO, and right. he was the man at HBO. Right. He made HBO Sports an incredible brand. And then he leaves HBO, and he signs the most Olympians out of every promotion. And then on top of that, he's got Bernard Hopkins, who ends up winning the middleweight tournament. But at the time, he hadn't won it when I signed with him yet. He was in it, though, and he would just beat Keith Holmes. Um, so, And he's a New York guy. So I'm thinking New York has just inherited an elite-level promoter. That's why I signed with Lou DiBello. It didn't play out that way. But that's in the, in the, at the time, that's how it seemed the table was set for me. And he's got all these guys. And I'm like, if I can join this kind of stable, man, I'm, I'm, I'm among the best, you know. Um, it Did you have out. offers from hmm? other promoters? Um, I was talking to other people. You know, Cameron Duncan was talking to me about taking me to top rank. Um, Lou Duba was around, although he was kind of breaking off of main events. Um, there was other people there. Um, but uh, so at the time, that's what happens. And then we, you know, we, where, where did I start this conversation? I lost my place. I see, I, 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 how did I wind up with the, with the promotion? Oh, the, the, the rematch with Endo? The rematch with Endo. Oh, and then, yes, the, the, the first fight with Endo, and I, and, I, and I was worrying. The reason I was also worried is because I know this is going to be a tough fight because I saw one of the fights I was studying when I fought Miguel was Miguel and Love Morendo, which, by the way, if anybody hasn't seen it, it's actually a really good fight. Love More, yeah. Love More has never been stopped in his career. He's like granite chin. I mean, he, he was taking the fight to Miguel. Miguel had to outbox him in the end. He, yeah, wasn't, even think, coming, he think wasn't even he, coming forward. I he, think he Love closed, Love More was chasing him. Yeah, Endu closed harder yeah. in the championship Love Love was chasing him, and Kodo. Miguel had to outbox him fight. to win the yeah, fight. you're right. Um, so... I'm like looking at this fight, and I realized the war I just had with Miguel the year before, and I'm like, man, this guy's gonna be on me, and he's got this ripped body, strong. So I'm, I'm picturing him to be just as strong as Miguel. I'm picturing like the worst possible scenario, you know. Mind you, I'll get into more detail. I had been promised that I was gonna fight Ricardo Torres, not Love Morendo, if I beat Edna Cherry. Now, don't as much as no we're, as spots, much as we're saying, as much as we're saying, oof, that's a world title fight too, because he True. had just beat yeah. Mike Arnudis. And yeah. I didn't think Ricardo Torres was that good. I thought he was a major, major puncher. He dropped Cotto. Yeah. I thought he robbed Mike Arnudis and winning the vacant WBO title once Cotto left 140 pounds. I thought he had two left feet. Didn't matter how hard he hit, I thought my feet, I thought my feet, my feet were too fast. I thought I was gonna just dazzle him. So I actually preferred that fight to this guy, Lovemore, who chases you all over the ring, and I'm a mover, and you can't get him off you. He'd gotten robbed against Sean Bay Mitchell for the WBA title um, well, earlier in his career, and he'd beaten Sean Bay. You know, and Sean Bay was a mover, a slickster, kind of yeah. like me, and he was chasing Miguel all over the ring, and Miguel had to end up outboxing him by the end of that fight instead of punching with him, right? So I'm thinking, man, this is going to be so difficult of a night, you know? So I'm training hard like I try, always train, but I'm also training very, very focused because I realize... I may lose, and, I, and, and while the first, the Cotto fight, the first loss of my career was a moral victory, and people still say, oh, you'll be back, you can't have two moral victories without a solid win. So yeah. you now have to win this fight, because you, you, if you get a moral victory, but, a, but an actual loss, yeah. you twice, now people are just going to start to say, You're a gay he's keeper. good, but yeah. he's not, I can't hack it at this level. Right. You're good enough and to not test to mention, guys, but not I'm to not be with, not, By this point in my career, I realized that Bella is not like a a top rank, or even at the time, Golden Boy, which was a monster promoter at the time, Golden Boy. So I realized I'm not with a promoter like this. So if I lose this title fight, I'm, I'm 26 years old. I may not get another world title fight till I'm 30. So I was scaring the hell out of me because I'm in the meat of my career now. I'm in the, and I've got to make this part count. I've got to win this world title, and I've got to make a lot of money in this part of my career. I can't go till I'm 30 without a world title because otherwise I'm just, you know, kind of just running in circles. So I, they were, I was scared, you know, so I was training. When I tell you I was training hard, it wasn't physically hard. It was physically, I was always training hard, but I was training with a, with a, with a fear focus, you know? Yeah. So and, do or die. And the dressing room, I remember the, I was nervous, you know, I, but I knew I was ready. I we had gotten very sharp for the fight, but, but I, I was nervous thinking like, we well, got to make it count. And I just remember calming down through the fight because Love more. Harold Letterman has such a distinct voice, man. <laughs> and I remember, I just happened to both times, I didn't even do this on purpose, both times, because he would give you the scorecards after every three rounds. So he'd give you after round three, I know, after, so going, going into round four and going into round seven, mm -hmm. the beginning of those rounds. And both times in the beginning of the fight, just those two times, I don't remember him doing it again later because I probably wasn't on that side of the ring. I happened to be on that side of the ring when he's giving his scorecard. And so I heard him, 30, 27, Poli Malinaji's got, I got her to shut up. And then I remember 60, 54, Poli Malinaji, he's dominating or whatever. And I'm like, yo, this is going to be my night. Like, don't get hit with something stupid. This is going to be my night, you know? And it was like, 
you know, growing in confidence, but there was, I still was like, have, I remember at like round 10 and, and, and Buddy McGurk's telling me like, well, you're going to be champion. And I'm like, don't even think about being champion <laughs> yeah. until the last bell rings. It's not the right thing. Like, you know? the other, other than you mentioned, you know, a moral victory against uh, Miguel Cotto, your mm -hmm. first loss. Uh, what fight was your hardest fight? Um, stylistically, Miguel is the hardest fight and the best fighter I fought. But stylistically, the worst matchup for me that was absolutely just terrible for me, Amir Khan. He's not the best fighter I fought, but stylistically, it just, it just, it just doesn't go. It doesn't go because he's a speed guy. Styles make fights. Yeah, he's a speed guy. I'm a speed guy. Um, he's, got, he's younger, faster, taller. Only guy that was ever faster than me. Um, and he's taller, lankier, rangy. So... I remember telling myself before the fight, if I can't outbox him with this kind of speed, because he had these weird arms. You ever, mm -hmm. ever play Street Fighter, the old video game? He's like, Dal <laughs> it's like fighting Dal Sim, you know, like, like, like yeah. when he had these stretchy arms. Long arms. And then so, yeah. and he was quick with his feet. So I remember telling myself going into the fight, if I can't get to him boxing wise, I gotta press him. I'm gonna press him, press him, press him, you know? And, um, and I'm going to see what he's got. You know, I, I told myself, you know, I've been to hell in the Cotto fight. Let's see if, he can, if I can take him to hell. But every time I got close, this guy would just grab me, hold my head down and grab me. And then Smoker would break us. And now I got to start all over again. And it's not easy to catch this guy, man. This guy's fast. Yeah. So every time I get close, he hold me and push my head down. Hold me and push my head down. And so it was like, I couldn't get to him. And he broke me down, broke me down, broke me down. But it's funny because a year later, a year and a half later, I'm working the fight when he fought Lamont Peterson. And he lost points by that referee for doing the same thing to Lamont. And everybody was complaining. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is what he does. You got to take points of this guy. He's always holding and pushing your head down inside. And he's taller. So he's able to just push you down. And then the referee just breaks you. And, I, and Lamont wins the fight because... Uh, Amir, I think I stopped his dude, deducted like two points. Yeah. So, well, you both guys, uh, anyway, both of you guys, throw, that was the worst fight for me. You guys right? throw a lot of combinations, and now mm -hmm. we're going to throw some rapid combos at, over at you. All right, favorite fighter of all time? Arturo Gatti. Uh, who's the one fighter you would have liked to face in any era? In any era? Mm. Chavez. Oh, you're a glutton for wow. punishment, man. Let you know me tell you, man. I like the, I like the <laughs> styles, though. Oh, really? I like okay. the styles, though. Yeah. You know, yeah. at least, yeah. you know, I, you might you might be excellent. Like Cotto was excellent, right? But I've at least got a speed advantage on you, so I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna be in it. I'm gonna be in it. I might win or lose. I'm gonna be in the fight. If somebody's too fast for me, which rarely anybody is, that you've got my biggest weapon. So with Chavez, I got a speed advantage. I, you know, not saying I'm gonna win the fight, but I'll tell you what. I got a speed advantage. I can, I can manipulate the fight my way in some ways. You know, I, I can make it. I can fight it. I can be in the fight. Well, you've already done something that most fighters, you know, don't really do. You've had a career and, and making a career in, in, in broadcasting. But if you didn't pursue boxing as a career, what would you have been? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because you used to be, when I was younger, I used to answer this question differently. I used to say porno star, but <laughs> but but, but <laughs> so, hey, there it is. No, but now, but now, um, I don't know to tell you the truth, man. I don't know. I was in a bad place. Um, I wasn't going anywhere. It's funny because I grew up with no father, right? Like, and and my mom got remarried, and I, I didn't get along with her husband, so I didn't, I didn't. I don't know how to do a lot of guy things. Like I can't change a flat tire. I can't like put a shelf on the wall. I only know how to fight, you know, because I didn't have a, a male figure in my house teaching me these things, you know? And by the time I got thrown out of my mom's house and living with my grandfather, who would have been that male figure, I wasn't listening to anybody. You know, I was already at that point in my life where I was, so I didn't have any redeeming skills at that time in my life to where if you're not, if you're not boxing, what are you gonna do? I really can't tell you what I would have done. I, I, I don't think it would have been good though. I don't think. Wow. It, well, um, considering, you know, uh, that you're always involved with boxing, what's the one thing you like to do, a hobby, an activity that completely takes you away and that's your happy place? Um, now, I mean, now that I'm older, I'm kind of more chill. Um, I like my 80s movies. I like my old school 80s and 90s movies. That's my favorite thing, you know? I like to watch a good old school movie. Better, better, better senses of humor, better plot lines, better, better. everything. Let me introduce you to my little friend, right? <laughs> yeah, for stuff for one of many. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite food? 
Uh, I, can't, I don't have a favorite food because I can be in the mood for Italian. I can be in the mood for Mexican. I can be in the mood for Japanese. I don't have too many foods I don't like. I'll be honest. Probably not good for a boxer who got to how to make weight his whole life. But there's not too many foods I don't like. I could probably tell you. I could tell you what I don't like. I don't like mushrooms. <laughs> Any, anything else is probably on the table. All right. All right. Well, I left this one for last. Um, on purpose. If you had the power to do one thing or change something in boxing, what would that be? Hmm. There's probably a lot of things. I, I don't know which one thing I'd... I'd oh, there's got to be one thing that irks you more than others. Mm, I'd, I'd make the drug testing so strict and I'd make the punishment for getting caught so strict that you'd never see another 35-plus world champion ever again. Wow. 35-year-old plus world champion ever again. Wow. Nor yeah. would you ever see a world champion in so many weight classes ever again. Because that's why you have the things, you, those things in boxing. Well, on that note, guys, it's, it's been great. We got to have you back. We got to, yeah, we got to, you know what I'm saying? Next like, week, next week, we're going to have, yeah. uh, um, Zab Judah. So, and remember, if you guys missed any part of this podcast, you know, you can listen to it on Spotify, YouTube, you can go on Twitter, Instagram, lip sync, whatever blue moon, Entertainment, Blue Moon Boxing. Here we are with uh, Polly Malinaji in the blue corner. And Blue. <laughs> I got a question for a boxing fan. And Blue Moon is following me around. That was Ricky's favorite beer. <laughs> I mean, we'll see. No, that no, no, wasn't Ricky's favorite beer. It was Ricky's song because it's the Manchester City song, Blue Moon. That's right. And That's then I right. got him a pack of Blue Moon after we fought, kind of to bury the hatchet. So Blue Moon is just following me. Now we got the Blue Moon show we over here. We got the Blue back, Moon man. gym. Think about this as your home away from home. Anytime Absolutely. I can't get away from Blue Moon. Yeah. Come on back, man. Absolutely. Come on back. There's lots to talk about. He wants to know, in prime of prime, who is more talented, Jones or Mayweather? Jones or Mayweather from a boxing fan. Who is more talented? Strict talent, Ray Jones. From a talent, talent perspective. Then ring intelligence, Floyd's smarter. But you're talking about talent, talent, Ray Jones is a more talented fighter. But Floyd's a smarter fighter. Well, on that note, guys, it's been a pleasure. Pauly Malinaji, always a pleasure. Like Doug said, this is your home. So for Pauly, Doug Fisher, I'm Jaime Mota. This is the Blue Corner. Thanks a lot for being with us.